<laughs> Good afternoon. Welcome to KAUST Live. Uh, we're coming to you from the Winter Enrichment Program on KAUST campus. This year's theme, Human Machine Future, aims to explore the ever-changing role technology is playing in our daily lives. So today, we have a very special guest, Professor Osama Khatib. Uh, he's the director of the Stanford Robotics Lab, and he's here to talk to us a little bit about his work. Osama, thank you so much for joining us. Well, Nick, thank you, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So start us off from the beginning. Where does robotics come into your life? Well, I guess my life is in robotics for so long. Uh -huh. uh, robotics is really uh, undergoing a, a very important transformation mm -hmm. in, in uh, dimensions and scope. Um, robotics has been uh, confined uh, to industrial robots. Uh, robots were working alone, mm -hmm. uh, a little bit bored. and. Um, with the advancement of technologies on computing, mob mobile uh, computing, uh, uh, autonomy, material fabrications, we started to see robots running outside of manufacturing mm. to, to the open spaces of human. And uh, uh, today's, uh, uh, or this year's theme uh, of uh, uh, the, the, the winter uh, enrichment program is so uh, perfect for what is happening with robotics. Mm. Robots are getting closer and closer to human, mm. interacting with human, collaborating with human, and uh, this is creating uh, a lot of interesting opportunities and many new challenges. Mm. So we are very happy to, to be in robotics uh, uh, at this time uh, when uh, we are facing uh, uh, really interesting uh, technical challenges, but also uh, a great potential of uh, making contributions to uh, to humans. Mm. What what are some of those technical challenges that you think? You know? So, um, in uh, industrial robotics, the idea is that you you set up the environment to make it structured, mm. so that uh, you can make sure that when you go back, you find exactly that same object uh, coming uh, on a, a conveyor belt. Mm. And uh, uh, you, you essentially are doing production where you are performing this same task over and over with precision. Mm. So these robots tend to be uh, heavy, stiff, and uh, dangerous. That's why we put them in cages. Mm. Now we are seeing robots coming to human environment, which means that robots has to be safe. That we cannot pre-program everything because the environment is, is very uh, varying all the time, changing. Even in, uh, inside uh, a home, when we talk about domestic robotics, we are going to see uh, things moving, uh, never in the same place. So that means we need to deal with programming the robot in real time. Mm. And that is very difficult uh, unless we start to acquire skills, understand how a human is able to, <coughs> to perform a task. Uh, human are amazing from that point of view and uh, we are learning a lot from human. So we are really changing the robot hardware, the robot software, controls, adding sensors, making the robot really intelligent robot. Mm. Uh, in uh, industrial robotics, the challenges were just to get the precision and uh, um, performance. Now we have to deal with so many other things that, that really brings robotics to, to the big light. <laughs> yeah. um, talk about a few examples of robot, uh, I'll say, solutions exactly yeah, that yeah. you've come up with. Yeah, well, <coughs> so, one of the things that brought me first to, to KAUST, in fact, uh, was a project that we pursued with the uh, Marine Biology Center here uh, in, um, in the area of the Red Sea. Mm. Uh, exploring the Red Sea uh, uh, coral reefs is challenging, mm. uh, but it is one example of all the challenges underwater. And uh, divers can go underwater for maybe 40 meters comfortably, but mm. then beyond that, it is really uh, difficult. And uh, there are so many 
uh, treasures, environment issues. Uh, we'd like to place sensors, do measurement, uh, collect samples. Uh, we cannot do it. Yeah. And uh, the robot today, uh, the uh, remote vehicles uh, are capable of uh, seeing, navigating, discovering, but they are not able to do things. Mm. So they can see but not do. And we thought, we developed uh, in my lab uh, a number of uh, uh, technologies uh, that brought uh, human, humanoid robotics to, to perform capabilities in the real world. So we thought, why don't we create a humanoid diver? Mm. And uh, which is technically challenging because you have to, to put all that electronics and all these degrees of freedom in the water without uh, uh, frying them. <laughs> and uh, we, we were able to do this uh, in collaboration with uh, a company, small company in uh, Palo, I mean in San Francisco, in uh, California. And uh, we were able to build the robot, take the robot to the Mediterranean mm. and um, deploy the robot uh, to recover some treasure from King Louis XIV's uh, uh, shipwreck in uh, the Mediterranean at 100 meters. So what is amazing about uh, the performance of that robot is that when this robot comes to the bottom of the sea and touches any object, you feel it in your hand Mm. sitting on the boat. So you have a haptic device interacting with the robot at a distance and you're almost like a surgeon operating inside the human body. Mm. So we are sort of doing surgery underwater. Mm. And this is sort of uh, projecting yourself through the, that mechanism mm. uh, to create a sort of an avatar uh, for the human in the water that can go to the depth in an environment that are di very dangerous. But this concept applies to mining, uh, where uh, the environment is quite dangerous for a human. Mm. It applies to uh, 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 rescue, uh, to um, same, same uh, application in space or, or uh, uh, other, other challenging uh, uh, environment. Mm. But uh, robotics, as I said, uh, is going into the human environment to, to reach human. So uh, we have the aging society in, in uh, uh, Japan, in uh, Europe, and uh, we are thinking about robots that can bring assistance to the elderly. Mm. And uh, so we, we're talking about domestic robotics. We're talking about um, Industry 4.0, where uh, essentially we, we're going away from the assembly line where things are very rigid, uh, <coughs> very costly to build an assembly line. <coughs> uh, small companies cannot afford it. Uh, but now we are talking about a robotics that allow, allow, to, allow a worker to, uh, to interact with the robot, where the robot is providing the muscles to lift and the human is guiding the motion, so providing the, the brain. In all these applications, we see this connection between human and robot in ways that, uh, uh, that was uh, completely out of question with, with uh, uh, the industrial uh, robotic setting. Yeah. Well, and, and I know that a number, uh, there are lots of examples where several technologies finally come to fruition, mm -hmm. and that makes another great advancement possible. Talk about the individual, you mentioned haptic feedback, but right. then some of the other bit parts that came yeah. together to make something like Ocean One possible. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the, the, first of all, uh, uh, creating computational power, sufficient computational mm -hmm. power to, to control the robot, uh, to handle the, the sensors, um, to process, to, to estimate, to do all these things. That was out of the question. So the CPU become, became faster and faster, and uh, that was a very important uh, aspect for us. But the mechatronic integration that brought about uh, processing uh, the, the data locally and extracting data that is relevant to what we are measuring. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you think about uh, tactile sensing, uh, you need a sort of uh, a grid, uh, a matrix of uh, uh, points 
and you you would you would have a lot of uh, cables if you bring that matrix in. and this is how we used to do it before and uh, uh, with mechatronic integration we are able to 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 combine all of that in a small ship and process it in the hand or on the on the structure itself uh, so we saw computational power mm. Uh, we saw uh, a new material, um, mechatronics uh, integration. New material is very important because uh, you can build these safe, lightweight robots. Mm -hmm. uh, we started doing this in the 90s and I, I saw this, this curve going so fast and now we are able to do it really without any, any, any problem. Uh, the other thing is, is also all of these enabling technologies uh, uh, brought the development of uh, uh, advanced sensors and advanced actuators. Uh, actuation, so when you think about the, the, the human arm, the human hand, and this is what Ocean One has. Uh, Ocean One has arms so that it can move and manipulate. It has two of them, so it, it does bimanual manipulation. So if you think about it, these are many object, rigid object that are moving with respect to each other mm. and uh, most often you need to connect them uh, by those joints and now you're taking them in the water. Uh, the pressure is so high, how can you handle that? So what we do is we put oil inside that has the same pressure as outside. Mm. That means we have connections between them, pipes and uh, and Doing all that integration was m almost impossible, except that today we have a new um, fabrication methods, uh, a new ways of, of bringing this integration. Yeah. I mean, if you want to, like, to be amazed about uh, life, what, what, what amazing integration in this small compact shape and volume we have. And uh, th this is uh, something that we, we, when we start looking at the technology, we admire in ways we cannot. Uh, how can I move this hand and put and manipulate and sense and actuate and coordinate all of, all of this in this very compact uh, way? It's, it's quite amazing. Right. And so you're, it sounds like you're getting quite good at mimicking human movements or <clears throat> as you need. But how do you make these human friendly, which I think you were starting to get at. Yeah. Well, um, so, so it, it's really interesting mm. uh, what you said, uh, which brings me to another point, which is the fact that, uh, yes, uh, we started observing human and trying to learn from human, uh, learn human motion, learn uh, uh, human skills, and encode, the, encode these into uh, strategies executable by a machine. Mm. Now, we discover that to really imitate human, we need to understand better human. We need to understand the musculoskeletal system. We need to understand the coordination, the strategies. And we started applying techniques we use in robotics that, that uh, allow us to model uh, and understand uh, the, the humanoid uh, robots. We applied these to human, uh, actually to any musculoskeletal system. We started looking at the, their dynamics, their motion, and we discovered that we had amazing tools that can let us understand better human. But as we were trying to understand the human, we realized that now we have tools that can not only serve robots, but also serve human. Mm. And uh, this, is, uh, this was uh, uh, something that we started using because uh, we can now uh, have a human moving uh, under a motion tracking system and we can in real time analyze the human motion. Mm. And then uh, if we have uh, uh, um, an athlete, we can instruct the athlete how to move to improve their performance. If we have uh, someone who is injured, we, we can prescribe um, 
uh, I mean, let, let uh, the uh, uh, specialist expert prescribe uh, uh, exercises to improve yeah. uh, their injuries. So all of that came to, uh, like to closing this loop. We were looking at the human to serve the robot, but now the robots, robotics, I mean, as a science body of, of knowledge, is now serving a, a human. Right. And uh, recently we, uh, we are uh, realizing this in the robotic community to a point where we, uh, we call on a um, uh, high level summit of uh, expert in, in all these different fields uh, to meet and uh, we are uh, connecting life uh, and uh, robotics in a way that uh, we, we never imagined before, uh, there is really this uh, loop closure between uh, machine mm. and life, and life uh, uh, ascending to machine. And, and right. this is really remarkable. Right. And so as people look to invite these machines into their home to care for their mom, to cook dinner, whatever mm -hmm. it is, how, how do you keep the humans in that space safe? Uh, yeah. from so <coughs> safety, safety, uh, is uh, probably the top priority for, mm. for any human robot interaction and uh, th that's why I, when I was talking about industrial robot I said we put them in cages. Cage, exactly. uh, we put them in cages not only we, we ask human not to to come t in proximity but we we are afraid they would break or throw something out of the cage so they, they are really close and um, so the, the the hardware itself is uh, very uh, stiff and rigid and heavy, which makes it uh, dangerous. So the first thing you you want to do uh, with the robots is to to build them uh, in lightweight. But building lightweight robots means you 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 you, you need a, a different uh, a technology in actuation. Um, uh, because when when you have high gears, you are not back drivable. Even if the robot is not too heavy, mm -hmm. then you might create um, uh, large impact forces. So, in our study, uh, in our studies of dynamics and interaction, we look at the impact forces uh, as a function of the reflected masses. So, if I hit there is some equivalent mass that I can measure here. Mm -hmm. And uh, these masses could, could be 100 kilograms or, or, or 200 kilograms. So with, with little bit of acceleration, you create a huge amount of uh, forces. So, mm -hmm. so what we are able to do today is to reduce this by 40, uh, 50 times uh, smaller masses and this is because we are able to create robots that are compliant. Mm. Now, how do we do that? Uh, well, adding sensors and adding control. So we go to each of the joints. Uh, if you, with a conventional robot, if you push at a joint, uh, you need to rotate this rotor so it resists and it feels very heavy. But if we have a sensor here measuring the amount of torque applied, we can use that information to tell the motor to rotate to help that pushing. Mm. And uh, the robot becomes so compliant. In fact, uh, my student uh, would play with the robot by just blowing on the robot and the robot would move in space. So once you reach that level, even, I mean, just thinking about the robot, it touches something, it's very gentle, it's very light. Mm. But then you need the skin to protect it, you need also the software, you mm. need the sensors. So the safety requires safety in the hardware, human-friendly robot design. You need a human-friendly robot software interface, all of that. And then also no robot will will be useful unless it's easy to use. I mean, it has to be very intuitive and uh, very easy to use. And this is uh, all uh, what we uh, basically are focusing on in terms of the interfaces. The interface, how to make the interface really uh, uh, simple, uh, uh, easy, and, and, 
and also accessible by non-expert. I mean, that is, that is uh, mm -hmm. still a challenge, but we, we are making a lot of progress in those areas. I, to, to watch any of the, the videos of, of you with your students in the robotics lab, one of the things that uh, becomes immediately clear is there's a, uh, an element of play, as you were saying, as the students play with the robots. Talk about how that is part of the creative process, part of the engineering process for you guys. Oh, <laughs> I, I mean, the, the, this, the robotics is so fu much fun. I mean, we, we, we're actually doing so much uh, uh, development in, 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 in terms of not only the research, but I think about uh, like in, in, in the education, every year we, we have a lot of students. We have remote students, but uh, our uh, local students can take a class called experimental robotics. And in this class, they ap apply their knowledge uh, that, that they, they acquired through the, uh, over the year. Uh, to real hands-on implementation on a real robot. Mm. And it is the, the, the most uh, exciting part of the year because that usually happens at the end of the year in, uh -huh. Ju in June. We, we have uh, the, the presentation of the projects. Uh -huh. And uh, the students uh, brings all kind of amazing projects, uh, juggling, uh, with with the robots or uh, uh, making uh, uh, drones landing on another robot, I mean, <laughs> every year they 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 come with a lot of creativity and uh, and they work in in teams. So uh, w w w which is really interesting because they bring they bring different skills uh, mm -hmm. to to the project, and this is what 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 uh, what is really special about robotics and also challenging about robotics. Robotics is multidisciplinary. It means uh, it's not only about uh, building the hardware, it's not only mechanical design, uh, but also it's uh, computer science because you need to program, but electrical engineering, and also, uh, well, uh, because you need to understand the human, so it brings biomechanics and biology, but when we, we think about robots that are uh, s socially capable of interacting with the human, then uh, we see all the social sciences coming uh, to, to this. And uh, 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 the medical aspect and, and this aspect and that aspect makes it almost spanning the whole uh, field of knowledge. And uh, that's why, I mean, when you, when you have a team, you need a lot of collaboration and you need to make sure that your team have all these different uh, expertise and the students really, really uh, have a lot of fun. Uh, and every, uh, every year actually we, we, we make uh, a film about uh, Stanford, the news produce a film about it. And uh, some of those uh, uh, videos uh, are, are very uh, popular, <laughs> right. in fact. Um, I, I find that Siri and Google don't often do what I ask them to do, and, and I, I can imagine that that problem is only multiplied when you put that into a, a body that can move around in 3D space. So how do you solve that problem uh, so that, as you said, you can communicate with these robots? Yeah, uh, I mean, you're bringing a very important point. I believe this is, uh, this is uh, something that uh, um, HCI, uh, a human computer interaction uh, community has been looking at and also um, in our community of robotics we are looking uh, at those issues uh, speech and communicating by speech actually with the robots is something that we are working on it is uh, <coughs> not there uh, we, we need to get it uh, already reliable uh, on its own but um, but it, it it's it's a very important uh, mean, mean means of communication for mm -hmm. for robots. Uh, we communicate with the, with the robots uh, through haptics, and uh, this is very robust. You 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 have a haptic device in your hand, and as you are moving your hands, the robot is immediately responding. So a robot can be your sensor remote sensor and you are feeling what is going on, you feel the texture. This is highly uh, precise and the resolution 
uh, spatial uh, resolution is w wonderful and uh, also uh, the, the dynamic and temporal uh, aspect of it are, are, are very, very uh, 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 fast. So ro haptics as an interface is, is, is very, very, uh, uh, is there. The, the, I think the challenge is uh, how to, how to uh, interpret uh, uh, complex tasks and break them into uh, uh, a network of uh, uh, a sequence of operation that can be executed by by the robot, and that that r r brings us to uh, m a lot of uh, aspect of the difficulties in. Uh, uh, online planning uh, of an action for some uh, complex behavior. So the way we are addressing this is to uh, think about uh, computer programming. Uh, in the beginning of uh, uh, computer uh, programming, we, 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 we used to go to uh, assembly language. We, we will program the, the computer with uh, like all the details. Yeah. and. Uh, this is what we have been doing with robots. We, d we, we, we describe all the details, every motion, every aspect of the motion to the robot and, and program the robot that way. But what we would like to do, uh, uh, like we, we, we do it in, in, in programming, we, we are abstracting the, the language to a level where we can say more complex things and, and uh, the computer digested and produce uh, the proper uh, uh, zeros and ones <laughs> where they must be in order to to uh, uh, to solve uh, th those questions mm. so for uh, robots uh, and robotics this is what we are trying to do we are trying to create more abstractions so when I say uh, take the this glass and uh, place it on, uh, on a table mm. uh, uh, the robot doesn't need to know where to take the glass uh, what point of contact uh, it's going to have, uh, where on the table, there, there is a, a whole mm. context uh, around which this is being implemented. And this brings us to a lot of issues in cognitive uh, aspect of robotics, in planning, in motion, uh, and uh, we are making a lot of progress in those areas. I mean, the, the functional aspects, lifting uh, the programming to a level where we can a program with skills that are in our libraries of, of the robot uh, is going to allow us to to really come closer uh, in 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 those uh, in the progress of those interfaces. Mm. But uh, um, to those students who are still uh, looking at project in robotics, there is no problem. We have many problems that that uh, needs to be solved, and uh, there are a lot of research uh, yeah. to come at at uh, those issues. But uh, uh, this is accelerating; the progress is really accelerating, right. and we are seeing more and more uh, interactive systems uh, capable of performing in real time and uh, capable of performing uh, more and more challenging tasks. Yeah. So you might be better positioned than anyone I can think of to prognosticate a little bit about the, the future of human and machine interaction. So what do you, what do you see as the, the next big leap uh, with humans working with robots? So, yeah, it's, it's always very difficult to, <laughs> to predict. I, I, I think sometimes progress uh, uh, it seems to, to, to be uh, very slow and uh, 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 suddenly things w change and, and uh, uh, you have solutions to some of the difficult uh, problems. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in robotics clearly we have, <coughs> we have uh, an acceleration uh, in the development that we are observing. Uh, we, uh, a lot of things co are converging toward uh, those solutions. And I, I can see uh, uh, more and more uh, uh, autonomy in uh, mobility. So we, we are seeing uh, uh, in the air drones, uh, on land, uh, even outside of here, there, there are uh, robots that are capable of uh, 
uh, creating uh, enough autonomy to perform mm. uh, uh, interesting tasks. However, in, in manipulation, in uh, assembly, in things that require physical interaction, we are, <coughs> we are going to need to create uh, uh, more skills and, uh, and acquire those skills in ways uh, that can generalize to, to uh, uh, more challenges. So I would, I would see uh, more and more interaction with human mm. uh, for a while. That is, human will be uh, not only benefiting from robots, but helping robots to perform their tasks. And uh, uh, I, I think this is, uh, this is uh, going to happen very, very soon. I mean, when we, we start to talk about uh, co collaborative work with robots, uh, industrial robotics will, will bring those solutions to manufacturing. Mm -hmm. uh, small companies will start to see uh, uh, reprogrammable, easy to use robots that can be integrated in their environment. Uh, I think uh, it, it will take little longer for home, I mean, to see robots in homes doing uh, uh, like challenging tasks in, that requires a physical interaction. Yeah. But I think we will see progression in, in that di di direction. Already we are seeing some, some uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, robots uh, in the homes uh, doing some, so, I mean, so, some simple tasks, but, but uh, th that, that, that is going to, uh, to, uh, uh, to change as uh, the capabilities of the robot will improve. Uh, in research, I think we are going to see uh, m m m more, more and more amazing things with the capability of robots. But taking, taking something from research from the lab mm. and uh, making it uh, uh, a product that, yeah. uh, that can be uh, used by many is, is going to take time. And, uh, and uh, that, that, that is because there are a lot of uh, safety issues mm. that need to be checked. There are a lot of, uh, I mean, these are very complex systems and uh, we have to be very careful how we deploy them in the real world. Right, right. So going from research and the capability to do something to actual product is a pretty big, uh, pretty big distance, I guess. Yeah. Well, uh, it, it is and uh, especially, especially when we are talking about um, the these robot uh, capabilities when they are interacting physically touching manipulating uh, d d performing tasks uh, in the physical world this is not a uh, not uh, a simple uh, uh, task and also it is uh, it, it, it puts the robot in contact and when the robot is in contact it could be uh, a, a challenge to uh, to, to guarantee uh, all the safety uh, aspect of, of that interaction. Right. And that's why the, t the, the technologies that are developing human friendly are not only human friendly, but environment friendly. That is, uh, you're, you're cleaning a window, you don't want to break the window. <laughs> and um, that means the, the robot has to, to, uh, to have that gentle touch and uh, uh, s sensors and everything working to create this compliance and whatever happened, the robot should remain that way. So right. you can see the challenge. Right. Very good. Um, do we have any questions from our, our audience here? Well, strangely enough, we actually have a robot which would like to ask a question. Um, this is Beam. Um, come on forward a little bit, Beam. And uh, why, don't you, uh, why, why don't you tell us what your question for Dr. Khatib is? I have one question. Uh, why haptic feedback is important for robot-human interaction? Uh, could you repeat so the question? That's, that's a, it's about the importance of haptic feedback uh -huh. and haptic, ha haptic sensory stimulation for human-robot interaction. Right. Uh, thank you for uh, this question. And um, uh, let me uh, just uh, uh, ask uh, a qu very related question. <laughs> which is, um, uh, would you like to be uh, operated by an autonomous robot without a surgeon? 
Could you please repeat? Uh, so uh, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, in, in uh, uh, surgery, we have a lot of robots now uh, uh, working very well, and you have always a surgeon behind. And uh, uh, I'm asking the question, uh, what do you think if we uh, remove the surgeon and get a robot to, to do the full operation w without the surgeon? No. Uh, <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> so you see how important it is to, to create haptic feedback to the expert. Uh, in many domains, when, we, when human want to reach beyond their uh, ability, like uh, uh, when we talk about underwater, reaching at uh, a thousand meter and uh, uh, being able to feel that environment or uh, touching an environment that is remote, uh, uh, the physical contact and the tactile information is amazing. And uh, many times for the, the actual operation, you need the expert to be behind. So when you are doing archaeology, you need the archaeologist. When you're doing surgery, you need the surgeon. And when, uh, when you are interacting with the physical environment, uh, the, the, the contact information is very, very important in addition to the visual infor information. So haptics provides that information and I think it completes uh, the feedback to the human in ways that we, uh, we could not uh, do it before. When, uh, when um, uh, people come to my lab and try haptics for the first time, they take the haptic device in their hand and they are going to a surface and they are going to touch. And when they touch, they go, oh my God, what is this? This is amazing. And, and that excitement uh, uh, co conveys how much uh, um, reality you are, you are, uh, you are creating uh, through uh, the haptic interaction uh, with, uh, with that environment or with that human. Okay, other questions? You. You're welcome. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Osama, for your great talk. And I have a question that uh, I know that for, we know that for robotic systems that there are a few uh, important components, so including, including the mobility, which is uh, feet and the grippers, a hand, eyes, perception, and the brain. And uh, from your opinion, what has been the one that is most lacking, that has been you know, not able to let the robotics be populated around our lives, and what would be next? Yeah. You know, breakthrough you, from your, opi op yeah. your opinion, yeah. Right. I, 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 thank you very much for this question. This is uh, uh, really a, a, an important uh, clarification of what goes uh, into a robot. So, uh, we listed uh, from the planning to the control to the perception uh, and uh, to uh, all uh, that interaction uh, that you create with the robot. Uh, all of these brings a lot of a lot of problems uh, that are challenging, and I think there 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 has been a lot of progress in 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 many of those domains. Uh, the the progress was more into. Uh, uh, perceiving the environment, you know SLAM, uh, simultaneous uh, mapping and localization. Uh, we have 3D now, we have uh, 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 information about uh, the uh, contact of the robot. We have uh, so much feedback that, that is uh, useful. Uh, we are making a lot of progress also in building lighter robots. Uh, we are uh, getting faster computers. So we are able to implement dynamic controllers. Uh, we have uh, improved a lot our uh, uh, planning system so we can create uh, trajectories and navigate. So there is a lot of progress, but most of the, the progress that we are observing is in uh, robots that are uh, moving in mobility. The progress in robots that are interacting physically with the world is a little bit still uh, behind and I think there are still challenges in that area. So the challenges are when we are asking the robot to, to perform a task that involves uh, assembly, uh, connecting things, and uh, uh, this has been always the case in the past and it continues to, to be the case 
But now we have a lot of tools and a lot of uh, uh, development and progress in sensing uh, and algorithms that, that hopefully will uh, let us make also progress in those areas. So I would say uh, uh, physical interaction w among robots, with the environment, and with human. This is, this is where, where progress is needed. Thank you, Professor, for an enlightening uh, talk. I would like to ask you a question that when you are talking about sensations, like you have sensory tactile sensations, you can see, you can hear. How about smell? Is there anything, any work going on to smell the environment, to smell the gases, to smell any sort of an odor? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you. This is, uh, this is a good uh, a question as well. Uh, uh, the, there, there has been a, a number of development, in particular in, in Japan, they, they created an artificial nose at Waseda University in Tokyo. And uh, uh, it is a, a chemical process uh, indeed. I mean, you, you're just going to uh, filter uh, from uh, the gases uh, you're going to filter what are the component and uh, this is uh, uh, this was done uh, to some extent uh, I, I i know about another uh, group uh, was looking for uh, gases in tunnels uh, that could be very dangerous and uh, uh, so uh, so you can see now the problem is not a problem for robotics, it's a problem of instrumentation. Uh, that is, if we have the sensors, we can place them on the robot and the robot will, will be capable of, of performing this. Uh, uh, which is uh, probably uh, very different from other, uh, other sensory information that, that requires uh, really um, uh, uh, dynamic treatment. So if you, you're thinking about uh, some contact you you have to move and and uh, uh, cre in order to have dynamic tactile uh, perception uh, in vision uh, also moving is very good for vision but in in, in, in smell you just need the, <laughs> the, the sensors themselves other questions uh, I have a I have a question I'd like to ask um, related to the, the sort of the extension of human capabilities that you've, that you've um, combined with robotics for deep sea underwater exploration, um, what other sort of extreme environments could um, robotic human interaction work, develop in, in that kind of relationship? And the, the most immediate one that I thought of was uh, space. So, for instance, um, you know, repairs to the International Space Station, that kind of thing, instead of doing an extra vehicular activity, could this type of process work in the same way there? Uh, indeed. Uh, uh, I mean, first of all, in the waters, uh, we're, uh, we are talking about 70% of the surface of the planet with depths that, uh, that are, in average, in kilometers. Uh, that are beyond anything that human can can reach, and uh, uh, the ability to to uh, uh, interact uh, with your hands uh, in those environment becomes important. So I mean, it is obvious there that uh, we really need uh, to, uh, to to create uh, uh, robots that can go uh, uh, there, repair, maintain. Uh, protect the environment, uh, deal will with the uh, incident when we have a disaster. Immediately we can intervene if we have uh, the crew of robots uh, at those depths. Uh, so th that is one area where I think, uh, I mean, it's, it's very important. There, there are uh, uh, other areas where uh, when we have disaster like Fukushima, uh, in Fukushima, we, uh, we tried to bring robotics, but we were not ready. And I think uh, we could have saved uh, a lot of uh, uh, the degradation of, of uh, what happened uh, by intervening quickly, because it was uh, just a matter of cooling in the beginning, and, and it de degenerated into something m much more serious. 
uh, earthquakes uh, where uh, we can also uh, have intervention not only to detect and see but really to to operate and and move uh, things now in space uh, huge challenge we have we have a lot of debris uh, we have uh, 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 we are making more debris with satellites that are falling. Uh, so, uh, can we repair satellites? Uh, can we uh, intervene uh, in ways where uh, we, we, we collect maybe some of the, 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 those uh, uh, things that are just going to fall and can, can, can be very dangerous to all the stations in their uh, uh, locations? So, uh, I think all of that is possible. Uh, it is uh, something that uh, uh, the different uh, space agencies around the world are working on. And uh, um, I, I, I think uh, all the technologies we are developing on land can, can be used uh, not only in space, but in, in uh, other planets uh, on the moon. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think already on the moon, we, with, the, with the little capability, we, we, I'm, I'm sorry, on, on Mars, with the little capability we brought to, to the planet there, uh, we were able to do a lot of amazing things. Uh, and uh, I, I think this is going to be, uh, 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 I mean, very soon uh, we will have a new missions that will bring more capabilities with the, with the future. Uh, of robots, uh, both to to uh, uh, other planets and uh, and also uh, to space, but uh, in all these environments, the common uh, thread is the ability of the robot to have enough autonomy uh, to operate and also to receive uh, feedback and uh, uh, to re ro 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 relay feedback to human so that human can intervene and uh, close uh, this uh, cognitive uh, loop, which is still uh, challenging for the robot autonomy. What I'm, I'm, I'm saying is that you have functional autonomy on the robot, and then you have the human brain, and the robot muscle, the human brain, and that connection create a synergy that is unique. And I think that is what uh, we are looking for. We have one more question. Ah, yeah. One more. I have one more question. And I would think that uh, the uh, technology always evolves together with the evolution of the society as well. So as we know that uh, we started in terms of the trans transformation or the uh, transportation, we start with the horse riding, and then we start to have steam engine cars, and then the high speed real high speed cars. All all this process, we you know the society will fit with the you know technology evolution with the road construction, highway construction. So in terms of robotics, I think, I think that the autonomous driving cars will, you know, the, the advanced perception will bring the indoor robots to the outdoor unconstructed environment. Where as well, as our engineering and scientists are struggling with how to solve those, you know, uh, extremely difficult uh, problems, uh, is there anything that we can do to influence the, you know, the government society to build a more robotic friendly <laughs> in environment to let, for example, have some sort of standard mobility for robotic systems right. that we can, you know, embrace the robotic yeah. uh, more sooner. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you again for, for this uh, good uh, observation. In fact, uh, I mean, the connection between technology and society is clear. And uh, we went from the horse to the uh, steam engine first before going to the car. <laughs> Don't forget that. And uh, uh, then we started creating pollution, and, and hopefully uh, uh, the, the, the technology brought some solution, but then degrad degraded this, uh, the, the problem. Uh, yes, uh, robotics is, is uh, bringing a lot of uh, uh, challenges uh, to the infrastructure, uh, but um, uh, the, the question about uh, about robotics and uh, self-driving cars and uh, uh, autonomous driving, uh, I think uh, is, is still evolving. I, I think in some areas we are talking about uh, self-driving and we see a lot of development there. Uh, but I personally feel uh, that uh, 
before reaching self-driving, uh, we, we should really think about uh, how much uh, augmentation we can bring to the driver, to the human, to the car, to make it safer, to make it uh, easier to, to make uh, those cars capable of reflecting to the human uh, what the condition of the road to, to stabilize, to do a lot of those things. And the technology can do an uh, enormous amount of uh, help uh, to avoid accidents and to, to, to uh, bring to a, a pleasant uh, experience of driving. Now, uh, autonomous driving also faces another challenge, which is that uh, we will still have, have a lot of human driving in urban environment. And as long as we have a human and, uh, and cars, autonomous cars, uh, the challenge is very, very uh, uh, big because uh, humans are difficult to predict, especially drivers. And in, in different cultures, it is uh, even uh, very, very hard to predict what the driver is going to do. And this is a very important part of driving. I mean, when we are driving, we are reading the signals of uh, the other drivers. So we could imagine infrastructure that uh, t takes uh, the smart cars or the self-driving to a portion of the road when we are on the highway, when we are in the long distance, but not really uh, uh, within the urban environment, the dense environment where we, there are a lot of uh, interactions. So uh, all of that b b brings, uh, I mean, a lot of, uh, um, uh, uh, I mean, a, a lot of uh, conversation between policymakers, the society, and uh, uh, my, uh, uh, my my experience is that in, in some in some cultures we are seeing that happening very fast. In some others, w w this is going to uh, to take uh, time. Uh, I, I, like. Uh, uh, Right now, I, I think there is a goal in um, in in China to 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 reach uh, uh, a new stage in in the infrastructure for driving uh, uh, less polluting cars uh, to to create uh, uh, m more more uh, uh, I mean safer environment for driving uh, within uh, the coming years and. Uh, th I, I think progress in that direction would be fantastic because uh, right now uh, in densely populated area we have a lot of pollution, we have a lot of problems and uh, uh, th th that is uh, uh, going to, to make a huge impact on the economy, on, on the life of people, on their health. So uh, all of these are uh, 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 connected and I think uh, the, the role of, uh, tech, I mean the role of uh, uh, governance is to deal with, with, uh, with those issues and to, to make sure that we have policies that address uh, how technologies uh, are used and how uh, technology can help uh, society uh, uh, for the betterment of a human. And uh, uh, I, I think uh, robotics is just a small part of this. I mean, there are a lot of other technologies that are being developed and uh, our society everywhere is is uh, uh, having that conversation about how to integrate uh, that technology in, in within the society. So. Very good. Well, thank you for, for being here, everyone in our audience. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, Professor Khatib, for, for being with us. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Nick, and uh, uh, thank you for uh, all for your questions. Uh, I. Uh, I'm sure uh, we, will, we will continue this uh, discussion about robotics and uh, all the associated technologies uh, in the future. Absolutely. And uh, uh, later on, I will be talking some, some more about, uh, about robotics uh, uh, this uh, afternoon. Very good. That, yeah, and thank you to our online audience for joining us. Uh, as Professor Khatib mentioned, he'll be uh, live on Facebook at 5.30. He's giving a, a keynote presentation. Uh, please, we hope you'll, you'll join us for that.